Um, now, just uh, to give you a little bit of uh, context on why we are here today. Um, so the workshop is organized uh, as a side event in the framework of the European Week of Regions and Cities, uh, which for the first time took place in a hybrid form, so both in Brussels and online. Uh, the workshop was proposed by Edge Riders. Uh, for those who don't know, um, it is an online community and a collective intelligence company, which has been for many years working on different topics, including the climate change, uh, through collaborations with various stakeholders, but most importantly, focusing on the communities and people on the ground. Uh, later today, you will hear more from the co-founder and uh, research director, Alberto Cotica. Um, I myself, apart from being involved uh, with Edroiders, I'm also a co-founder of a cultural organization based in Split, uh, Croatia. And we are currently coll collaborating with Edroiders on a pilot project, looking into the problem of the sea level rise and coastal communities in the Mediterranean. So to go back to today's uh, session, uh, in the next hour and a half, uh, we will look at uh, ecological modernization in an inequality perspective and focus on regional as well as social justice. Uh, we have with us several inspiring experts and hereby we thank you for joining us uh, today. Uh, Vasna Ramazar, a senior uh, lecturer at the University of London, Sweden. Uh, we have Roberta Kuka, Associate Professor at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. Uh, Astrid Van Sten and Lionel Ox from METOS, uh, a research and innovation consultancy. And finally, Alberto Cotica from Edge Writers. So the idea is to first listen to the short presentations by our speakers. So you have around seven minutes each. Um, I invite all the guests also to post your questions in the chat uh, during the presentations because we will have afterwards enough time to address the comments and go through all of your questions and also to give you a floor as well to discuss um, together uh, around this topic. So we are very much looking forward to hearing your presentations and discussing afterwards. Uh, if there are no uh, questions. I hope all is clear. We could uh, now uh, start with presentation. So I will give the floor to Basma. Great. Thank you very much, Marina. And hello, everyone. Uh, as Marina has introduced, my name is Vasna Ramasa. I'm an Associate Senior Lecturer at Lund University. And a lot of my research is focused on the questions of justice in the energy transition. So with the seven minutes that I have, I'm going to set the scene a little bit in terms of thinking about why we need to focus on justice and how we have this entanglement of climate change and social justice. And a starting point that I want to put forth uh, for us to think about is that in a lot of the work around climate change, uh, but especially within an ecological modernization framing, we have a process of depoliticizing issues of climate, issues of ecology. So whether it's about thinking about nature as something out there that's separate from society, uh, whether it's about thinking of nature and climate change as something to be addressed either through technology or through carbon markets, um, it's often divorced from the social relations that are very much embedded into a great deal of climate change and also the solutions to climate change itself. And what we really see currently in the world is that climate change is starting to have significant impacts. We're seeing that already through the floods that have happened in uh, Germany, so within Europe itself, but also more desperately what has happened in Pakistan and other in Nigeria right now. So the forms of climate injustice can be both in exposure to risks such as extreme weather events, um, longer term sea level rise and loss of territory, but also in terms of the solutions that we put and where those are located and what does that mean for dispossession of land from people. 
It can also be related to access to environmental resources. We're seeing land grabbing for renewables, such as biofuel programs happening in the global south in Africa, privatization of water and energy sources, but also access of local people being limited to particular areas because of red plus projects and so forth. And all of this has to be understood in terms of how environmental risks tie into socioeconomic conditions and social determinants. So one thing that is very clear when looking at the relationship between social justice and climate change is that many of the vulnerabilities that we already see in place, the socioeconomic inequalities that exist, are being exacerbated through climate change. And we can see this taking place across a number of different scales. So within the body itself, between and within countries, between countries, and also in the global picture of the world and how society is organized, right? If I think about it in terms of the gendered aspect of different bodies experiencing climate change differently, we can understand the biological susceptibility that women might have during pregnancy. We can think about who are the primary caregivers when it comes to environmental health risks, but also who has opportunities and access to labor, to loans, who has voice in decision making. And all of these are gendered as much as they are also uh, related to issues of class, of education, of race, etc. Right. Um, and another way that, and this is just an illustration in terms of voice, how certain voices are left out of the climate change discussion. You might be familiar with this image of Vanessa Nakate, who was taken out of the pictures with Greta Thunberg at the World Economic Forum in Davos, the only woman of color from the global south whose voice was left out of this. A lot of this we can also understand in the global picture in terms of what Rob Nixon talks about as slow violence. So this intersection of class, race, ethnicity, gender, and different identities are starting to intersect with the environmental inequalities being brought about um, by climate change. And that can be understood as part of a matrix of coloniality in terms of whose bodies, whose resources are most at stake, but also whose knowledges and ways of being are also being threatened, right? To illustrate that, we can see the ecological footprints, and this is a diagram just showing sort of which parts of the world, so between states, the inequalities are using more resources and which are using less. And as we can see, the consumption of the global north having much more impact in terms of climate change than the consumption in the global south. We can also look at this in terms of historical emissions and understand that there are there is a history and a debt that is tied into who has caused climate change, who has emitted the most, and those emissions still being in the atmosphere uh, resulting in the climate change we're experiencing right now. Taken as a global society, we also see this in terms of class relations and how, um, in, and this is an old diagram from the carbon inequality report, which showed that in 2015, the richest 10% were responsible for 49% of emissions, whereas the poorest 50% were only responsible for 7%. Through the global pandemic, those numbers have been exacerbated, but there's a huge discrepancy, and this is tied in to questions of social justice, right? We can understand this partly in terms of ecologically unequal exchange and also ecological debt. The notions of how the majority who overexploit the global commons owe an ecological debt to those who are in possession of resources, but also are the ones who bear the greatest burden of climate change, right? And so some of the questions that we need to think about and hopefully will be developed further through the rest of the discussions are who has the power to make decisions that affect climate? Um, how are the environmental degradations and social inequalities related? And also whose knowledge counts in this, as well as how people mobilize politically and socially to address both the climate crisis and social inequalities. And we need to ask these questions to programs such as geoengineering. Where are these solutions to be located, for example?
So just in the last few seconds that I have left, I just want to remind people that what we're talking about when we talk about climate justice is not necessarily equality, that we treat everyone in the world the same, but actually that we understand that different things are needed by different people in order to achieve justice. And also to remind you that the world we live in right now is not focused on climate justice, but rather a reality where we're taking away from the people who are most vulnerable. So at the end of the day, I'd like to just conclude this initial thought by saying that if we think about climate change, we need to talk about climate justice. And that is very much also about racial justice, gender justice, and environmental justice. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vasan. This is super insightful and many questions I hope that we will raise um, later. Um, so next on the floor is Roberta. Hi, I hope you hear my voice. Uh, my name is uh, Roberta and I work at the Norwegian University of Life Science. And uh, in some way, I think that my presentation presentation is uh, really complementary uh, to Basma's presentation. Uh, today I will uh, try to give some um, ideas, insights about uh, some possible uh, uh, trade-off or uh, unexpected effects in terms of social and spatial justice of uh, uh, policies and uh, uh, strategies implemented uh, um, in order to promote sustainability and greening at local level. And the example I'm talking about today is from Norway and specifically is about the city of Oslo, uh, which is the city that uh, actually I know uh, the most here in Norway. And uh, um, basically this presentation is uh, uh, the result of uh, quite intensive um, work that I'm doing with uh, Rebecca Kavikia, who is a PhD candidate here at the Norwegian University of Life Science. Uh, yes, today I will um, give some uh, information and insights from the city of Oslo. Um, basically, at international level, Oslo is very much recognized uh, for uh, uh, its effort to uh, become a green capital of uh, Europe. Uh, um, over the last 10 years, um, 20 years, the city of Oslo has been uh, very much uh, oriented towards an agenda uh, for uh, sustainability policies, for uh, especially green uh, renewal. And uh, the efforts are very much visible all over the city who has uh, visited the Oslo 20 years ago. Today is not usually able to recognize the city, starting from the waterfront that used to be a very polluted uh, um, harbor uh, that today uh, looks like a very attractive place where people can swim in a quite uh, uh, clean uh, area uh, of uh, the fjord that can enjoy a very high standard of, uh, of life. But also because uh, Oslo International has been uh, um, quite uh, well known for uh, its support in, uh, for example, driving policies for sustainable mobility in terms of uh, uh, clean mobility, electric mobility, uh, car-free uh, areas. So um, this effort uh, is still uh, going on and uh, uh, hopefully in um, five years time, a large part of the center of Oslo will be basically completely uh, car-free. Uh, car uh, today, uh, Oslo is also considered the capital of Tesla, <laughs> since uh, the majority of uh, cars uh, sold uh, over the last years actually are uh, electric cars, and it's very uh, much recognized internationally uh, for uh, this kind of uh, effort in uh, driving uh, this kind of uh, policy for sustainable mobility. But today I will um, maybe tell another side of the coin. Uh, I think this is very much, uh, um, in, in some way, uh, we can tell that uh, Oslo is a paradigmatic example of a city that uh, has implemented um, a strong and convinced ecological modernization agenda uh, in the framework of uh, growth. Uh, strong demographic growth. Oslo is uh, the, first, the first capital in Europe 
as far as uh, demographic growth is concerned. It's a fast growing city, uh, both in terms of demographic, but of course also in terms of economic uh, and economic uh, aspects, uh, especially in this moment, uh, unfortunately, I would say. Uh, but it's a very fast growing city. So it's a kind of paradigmatic uh, example of an agenda implemented through two main uh, um, strategies. The first uh, uh, actually uh, is uh, less uh, um, famous worldwide, but it's very relevant for Oslo and it's uh, a densification strategy um, provided through uh, the renewal of uh, large brownfield areas uh, in uh, the center of the city, uh, very much oriented to the capping strategies in the housing sector. So this is, uh, um, I would say, the most important strategy that actually uh, has been promoted in Oslo over the last 20 years. And the second is, of course, uh, the implementation of green strategies. And um, so in terms of um, uh, renovation of very large areas, uh, parks, uh, close to the blue infrastructures uh, and so on. And later I will show you some uh, example. But uh, in a specific framework, and this is very important to take into consideration and very often it comes as a surprise when we are talking about Norway. Uh, because uh, it's a framework characterized by uh, a specific uh, housing regime and this housing regime in Oslo is uh, um, very much dominated by the private market. Basically uh, in uh, Norway the municipal housing sector is extremely residual, only the three percent, and a large part of the population own uh, the, the, the house where they live. Uh, in Oslo we are around the 70% that is very, very high uh, for uh, uh, a capital city in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. And of course, uh, in the general uh, framework of the financialization of the housing uh, market and uh, a progressive retrenchment of housing policies. Um, I, I, my uh, the three minutes left, I will try to argue that there are some important social spatial implications of this strategy. Um, the one that uh, I used to call a sort of a green segregation effect uh, uh, is related to the concentration of privileged groups in the most sustainable segment of the housing stock. And it's in especially important in this moment to highlight that this is uh, um, strategic uh, due to the, uh, of course, the rising energy cost. Nowadays in Norway, um, of course, um, some uh, strategies uh, of price cap uh, have been uh, implemented at the local level, so energy costs are very, um, in this moment, uh, do not represent any more um, an emergency uh, at local level, but of course uh, it's para paradigmatic of what uh, can be produced in, uh, of course, context less uh, rich in terms of uh, resources and that are extremely affected nowadays um, um, uh, by process of energy poverty and so on. So I would say that the first social uh, special implication of this strategy is the concentration of privileged groups in uh, um, this, this uh, um, sustainable uh, housing sector. And the second uh, social special implication uh, is related to what we uh, call usually a green gentrification effect. It means that the renovation of these areas very often uh, drives a process of expulsion of the less privileged group from areas characterized by high environmental standards. So these are the two main uh, processes that I would like to discuss today. Um, I think this is extremely relevant because uh, uh, it's very much uh, um, related to uh, issues of environmental justice and especially uh, issues related to an unfair distribu distribution of environmental goods um, and also in terms of a social spatial justice problem and especially related to rights to the city. 
First of all, densification. Um, maybe um, this is uh, not very much uh, known uh, internationally, uh, but uh, um, Oslo uh, is a city that has promoted strategies of densification, first of all, in order to preserve um, um, a green ring around the city, uh, quite impressive. Uh, the name is uh, Marka, is uh, the boot, and it's very important for uh, Oslo population, uh, both in the summertime and in the winter time. And because uh, the um, incredible fast demographic grow, uh, Oslo has decided to promote strategies of densification in order to accommodate an increase in population. I mean, this has been done, especially in the city center of, uh, of the city and around transportation hub in order to try to promote sustainable mobility strategies. So what is uh, the implication of this strategy? First of all, that in terms of landscape, of course, uh, we are uh, uh, fast uh, seeing a transformation from this kind of landscape to this kind of uh, uh, landscape that is very much contested. But the second one uh, that is uh, maybe less uh, well known is that uh, um, in this framework of densification, um, we have seen the in increasing, um, um, uh, uh, increasing unaffordability trends. If in 2010, the um, first time buyers could afford the 20% of the housing market, in 2020, only the 0.4% of uh, uh, first-time buyers could afford to buy in Oslo. And this is especially, of course, uh, targeting um, um, not only low-income uh, households, but also um, households with uh, medium low income who are not able to afford uh, a place in Oslo anymore. And this is especially visible in areas of new densification that we can define extremely um, um, sustainable when it comes to energy cost uh, and so on. So this is a, a first uh, implication and is related to a sort of a progressive concentration of most privileged group in the new housing uh, um, sector in Oslo. The second uh, strategy is related to green strategies, um, especially on, on uh, blue infrastructures. Uh, we have already seen some pictures about the waterfront, uh, the fjord, but this is going on also around the, the rivers, uh, for example, that uh, I'm studying right now. And uh, uh, this is also going on very much around the uh, car-free areas. So the, in some way, the mixture of these interventions, so densification, uh, greening strategies around uh, the blue infrastructures, and car-free areas uh, are uh, progressively creating conditions for uh, uh, gentrification that with Rebecca we have studied in different areas of Oslo. So it means that around these new areas of uh, green redevelopment and uh, sustainable uh, uh, housing, um, very, there is gentrification going on also in the areas around these uh, densification uh, areas. So, in some way, we can uh, first of all argue uh, if we can describe Oslo as a green capital or the capital of green gentrification. Um, and finally, I just want to leave a few open questions for discussion. Uh, and uh, here it's, uh, for example, how can we avoid these trade-offs between sustainability dimensions in the housing sectors? It's possible to promote both environmental friendly housing sectors and affordable housing uh, sectors. Uh, what are the policy or the governance aspects that we have to take into consideration? Uh, what is uh, the role of bottom-up strategies? Because unfortunately, sometimes we see some uh, gentrification um, process uh, drive uh, by uh, these kind of uh, uh, strategies implemented by local committees. And uh, finally, um, what kind of uh, housing or urban planning strategies can be effective in order to promote both affordability and sustainability in the housing sector? Thank you very much. I leave the floor to the next one. Thank you so much, Roberta, for showing us this other side of Oslo. Um, I will give the floor now to Astrid and Darnell. Hello, everyone. 
third presentation um, linked to the others. So good morning. I am uh, Astrid. Um, this is my colleague Lionel, and we're both be speaking. And um, we're both sociologists working at Mythos. It's a, we're a research and innovation agency based in Brussels. And we work for a lot of public institutions also in Brussels. And recently we've been working on the social aspects of access to water and also on energy transition in the context of um, social housing. And we're happy to share some insights with you. Um, and also we would like to hear your ideas um, as we came across an interesting point uh, in this debate on social inequalities and climate and energy transition, but that's for later. Let's start by describing uh, an important program from the energy and climate plan of the Brussels capital region to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The program is called uh, Renolution and is um, situated in the sector of the construction and renovation. Knowing that this sector <coughs> is responsible for most greenhouse gas emission and knowing that real estate infrastructure for both public and private building is not energy efficient, targeting this sector by setting up a renovation program is a central axe uh, in the Brussels energy and climate plan. These uh, regional plans are driven by the European objectives, which stipulate that by 2050, the greenhouse gas emission will be reduced by 80%. And for Brussels, it's a huge challenge um, for the housing sector. It implies that basically all buildings uh, have to become more than half as energy efficient that, as they are today as uh, most houses in Brussels are old, uh, in bad condition and not insulated uh, enough. And thus the region is working hard to achieve this goal. And uh, they do so by developing a large set of uh, actions and measures as part of the resolution uh, policy plan in order to stimulate uh, energy efficient uh, renovations. There is, for instance, uh, a, grant scheme, a grant scheme for individual uh, homeowners or the access to energy advisors or the development of a more circular uh, economy. All of these 31 uh, measures are developed uh, by different stakeholders of the region with the ambition to lower greenhouse gas emission uh, in Brussels. But now let's have a look first at the context in which this resolution has to take place. And so what is the, the local Brussels context? Because taking into account the local context and the people that make up this context is a crucial step. And this is a lesson we've learned from the French president Emmanuel Macron, whose carbon tax, which was presented as an ecological measure, was the start of the nationwide <laughs> protests uh, in France in 2019. You know, the yellow vest, Chile jaune. So we've learned that lesson and we look, in, we look into the context. And so this is the region of Brussels, and this figure shows the number of inhabitants uh, living in, in the Brussels region. And as you can see, the Brussels population is not evenly spread over the region. The red bubbles show the densely populated areas in the northwest. And in contrast, in the southeast, depicted by the blue uh, bubbles, uh, these are the areas where far less people uh, live. So in Brussels, we talk about the poor crescent. Uh, um, you see depicted by the red dots, it's like a, like a moon circle. And um, in these areas, uh, not only more people live, uh, but also the socioeconomic status <laughs> of the people living there is far more challenging uh, compared to, to the people um, living in, in the blue bubbles, uh, if you, if you want to say it like that. And uh, also they have lower sal salaries, lower levels of education and unemployment rates uh, are higher. 
And just to give you a good picture um, of the inequality in Brussels, um, because it is, is like blatant inequality, um, even if Brussels is the richer area compared to Flanders in the north and Wallonia in the south, 31% of the people in Brussels live below the poverty line. And so, um, as we know, these socio-economic inequalities, they don't stand uh, on themselves. They don't stand alone. Uh, we know that one kind of poverty really intersects with more uh, situations of precarity, of inequality. And this map shows the air quality and pollution in the region. And so it shows that people living in this 4% basically inhale more polluted air. It uh, doesn't stop at social and spatial inequalities in Brussels, but it goes beyond that. Uh, we also witness a gap between the health of people living in the poor versus the rich uh, neighborhoods. And these three maps, uh, they show the disparity between these rich and poor areas for the screening of different uh, diseases and caretaking. And so in the red areas, we see less prevention and screening for, for instance, uh, uterine cancer, dental care and diabetes, um, so in the poor areas. And so we all know that uh, by consequence, less prevention obviously leads to higher morbidity and mortality rates. These uh, interlinked uh, inequalities give rise to unequal opportunities and unequal access to public services and institutions in general. And if we go back to um, housing renovation, for example, that I talked about earlier, it gives a very clear example of that. As the figures on the slide show here, people with lower household budget take fewer steps towards energy efficient uh, renovation. The graph shows the level of insulation of windows, for example, double glazing, walls, roofs, and we see that people with lower rate of revenue obviously just insulate uh, less. What we saw also in the research we've conducted at, uh, at METOS for the region is that the instrument developed by the region, the, the one that I showed earlier, meant to stimulate renovation, such as grants, for example, are not used by the people who need it the most, but by the ones who have the economical and cultural capital capital to decide on renovation, to be able to fill in the documents and applications, to understand technical terms, etc. So with respect to access to energy efficiency and renovation policy, there is a clear risk of uh, leaving uh, people behind. Now, what we see is the regional climate and energy plan um, is in, in these plans of the region is that the region does integrate the notion of social justice in its policies. Of course, driven by the European Green Deal, the Fit for 55 package and the Territorial Just Transition Plan. <laughs> for example, we can read that the Brussels region has a clear ambition to pioneer in both the ecological and solidarity transition. In the report, then, the, the ecological and socially responsible approach are often mentioned um, together. <clears throat> At METOS, we've also been working on very concrete uh, projects uh, for the institu institutions in, in the Brussels regions where social justice linked to climate and energy transition were at the heart of the project, starting from the idea of leaving no one, uh, no one behind. For example, in a project for Environnement Brussels, the regional institute responsible for environmental matters, we've worked on political measures and instruments to help the most vulnerable people when they are in a situation of water poverty, meaning with no or difficult access to, uh, to water. Another project was on the renovation of social housing complex um, a recent study in, uh, in Belgium showed that 44% of the social housing complex um, in Belgium were extremely energy uh, intensive and thus a lot of renovation uh, projects are being set up in uh, of social housing and there the social acceptance of this kind of huge transformation is central to the well-being of, uh, of the inhabitants uh, who are usually 
people living in difficult or vulnerable uh, situations. But most of the time, this, this transformation happens without consultation or participation, which causes friction on all levels of the renovation uh, process. So this uh, paternalistic and one-directional approach uh, is often also a missed opportunity to get people on board on uh, the importance of uh, energy efficient housing solution. These projects, the two projects that I've just mentioned, are concrete example of initiatives to take into account the most vulnerable groups in society with respect to uh, energy transition questions. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have seen this ambition also at the level of local uh, municipalities in Brussels. Uh, in the case of the commune of Forêt, uh, for example, uh, located in the southeast of Brussels, the, the local politicians there are drafting a climate action plan which integrates the notion of social uh, equality in the plan. And uh, they have done so by underlying what they've labeled as and then the mental environmental inequalities, which highlights the unequal distribution of environmental quality between the different social groups and geographical areas of the municipality, as well as the unequal exposure to the risk of climate change, depending on the areas of the municipality. For example, as you see on this uh, graph, the hottest areas of the, of the municipality with less greenery are also the poorest neighborhoods and the ones with less permeable soils, thus also more subject to floods. Even in economically developed areas like Forêt, vulnerable groups have fewer financial resources, less insurance coverage and fewer opportunities to adapt to new climate uh, circumstances. Now, what Forêt is, uh, is doing is that they have institutionalized this notion of environmental inequality into their local climate and energy plan so that it becomes a criteria to evaluate the relevance of measures taken on energy and climate uh, matters. So, um, moving towards a fair energy transition for all seems to gain more and more attention and traction within Europe, uh, for example, the Fit for 55 program, but also on a regional and local level. Um, so this idea of leaving no one behind, uh, it seems slowly, slowly um, start to make an entrance. However, uh, lots of the plans, um, at least in the Brussels uh, region, stay at a, a diagnostic level for now. So actually, we haven't come across of the far-reaching and ambitious additional policy instruments and plans for vulnerable people aiming to tackle uh, the challenges of a fair energy transition. <clears throat> and this, um, this leads us to the end of our presentation, actually. So even uh, if the fair energy transition ambitions on regional and local levels often still remain intentional and diagnostic, the bottom line stays the same. There is an urge for eco-social inclusion. And um, we've recently noticed actually a new focus on health and health issues in public and urban planning. So since the pandemic specifically, there have been increasing calls for urban programs and infrastructure to be systematically examined and developed from the point of view of uh, the health impact. For example, think about mobility, air quality, housing, consumption patterns, energy management, social and spatial inequalities, and for each uh, their specific health impacts. So this shift in focus towards healthier cities or regions could provide maybe a comprehensive angle to uplift vulnerable communities um, transitioning to sustainability. So this is actually our question because we've came across this. This to us was a, an interesting idea, but we would like to, to open up to this group because we don't have the answer. Um, our question is as follows. Could a health approach be an interesting angle towards greater eco-social inclusion? Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, uh, both of you. So much interesting data and it was quite interesting to see Brussels also from this side. Um, I'm going to now invite Alberto for a final presentation. Right, here I come. And hopefully you can see my screen. So I would like to talk about the discontents in the green transition and its discontents. So we've heard from, uh, from Lionel and Astrid the, about the, the French movement of the Gilets Jaunes, sparked by an environmental policy in France. Uh, Roberta told me about the, the single issue political party that now in Norway wants to fight uh, the, the uh, charges for car drivers into city centers. Again, Brussels in these, in these very days is seeing uh, quite a lot of controversy around its new traffic and mobility plan. So there seems to be quite some trouble and there seems to be a, inconsist a consistent inability of policymakers to see it coming and, and prevent it before things get, get too bad. So that's what I'm going to be looking at. So, from where we are standing, the green transition presents as urgent and unavoidable. There is the sense of this, this narrative of we must change, we must change now, tomorrow is too late, uh, backed by environmental data. But we don't really understand what the change means in, in several cases. And that makes change a tough sell. You're, you're going to be stepping into something, but you don't quite know what that something is looking like. This is not because people are not doing any scenario analysis or foresight, because they clearly are. This is a screenshot from the IPCC uh, latest report, AR6, and it's full of, of scenarios. That's what they do. But these scenarios look pretty alien and non-actionable to the majority of citizens. They will say things like, you know, with high confidence, we predict that the limit of boreal forest is going to shift north you know, a few hundred kilometers, and that is going to lead to substantial loss of ecosystem services, which is okay. But what does that mean for me? I mean, what, what is my job going to look like? What is my school going to look like? What is my life going to look like when that happens? So what are my options and what are they going to look like? This, this part of the, of the debate is, is, uh, is not super clear. What is clear, uh, already from the fairly conservative uh, IPCC is that uh, there is an insistence on economic transformation and social transformation. So uh, this, this new report in 2022 is the report in which they start saying, ah, systems change, economic, social, is not, no longer only about planet science. And that means we are headed for controversy. We are headed for controversy because all of this research is going to encode values and specific worldviews. Uh, Roberta's presentation showed this very clearly. These, these policies tend to be designed by middle class people who can afford a Tesla and can afford a, a, a new house in the center of Oslo and they just like their waterfront clean. You know, it's reasonable, we all do. But maybe they fail to consider the point of view of other people that might then push back. And this pushback is value oriented sometimes. You know, people will sense that their own values are at odds with those that inform the policy, and then we will contest the frame itself. And that means you can't solve this by expertise. Expertise is not going to be accepted as a valid argument, at least not always, because expertise is not perceived to be neutral. And so what happens in this case? Well, uh, the American political philosopher John Dewey, in uh, uh, the beginning of the 20th century, came up with this really interesting notion of what he called an issue public. And his idea is that exactly in this situation, when, when, when expertise is contested, when the established frames for problem solving break down and they no longer can kind of corral the whole of society into a, a, a communal effort towards the, a common goal, then democracies will spark competent issue publics who self-select to start an inquiry about the issue at hand. They can take a step back. So why are you in this situation? What does it mean? Can we break it down? And it seems that this is happening around the social and economic aspects of the green transition. I mean, we in this room are, in, are an example of it, but there's, there's a lot more. So this is, an, this is three days ago. 
like a really substantial uh, ERC grant uh, assigned to fairly radical ecological economists in academia to uh, look up pathways to degrowth. So this is new. It's, it's now looking like uh, uh, the, the, the urgency of a grid transition is urgent enough that the European Union is willing to fund research into radically different economic paradigm, not based on economic growth, which is great, but doesn't really solve the problem of what, what is this going to look like from the point of view of the lived experience of people. And it doesn't solve the problem of the divergent values and, and worldviews of the different swaths of our, our population. So what can we do? Well, uh, future scholars uh, uh, that study and practice um, scenario building, they have an idea. And this idea is, is called, is a concept called world making, is a concept for 20th century philosophy, and it applies to a situation that, that this literature calls discordant pluralism. Discordant pluralism is it, what we've been describing, you have groups of people that have incompatible worldviews and nevertheless they need to work together and to make common decisions. This is kind of a tough call and the idea behind world making is that you can often solve this problem by casting scenarios as different worlds. So when, when that happens, there is this like really nice quote from, from Jos Verwoort and, and his collaborators, which says, in the, in the presence of a, irreconcilable epistemic differences, when you, when you build your scenarios as different worlds, then people can retreat in building their own uh, uh, scenario, their own alternative. And then they, instead of fighting with the others and, and delegitimizing one another, they, they concentrate on making their own alternative look more attractive and more and better defined. And that is why very far from solving any, any kind of major controversy, it does bring clarity and at least the possibility of, of, of a future recomposition. So this is the only, uh, or the most convincing anyway, uh, attempt that I have seen at dealing with the situation of discordant pluralism, uh, which is likely to be dominating our political landscape pretty soon. And to close up, I would like to argue that when you have issue publics that are engaging in making scenario building in the presence of discordant pluralism, so people will present your different, their different ideas of what Brussels or Oslo or, you know, wherever it is we happen to live is going to look like and they would like it to look like. Then when that happens, it is a, it, ethnographic methods are a good idea to try to pick up this, 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 uh, the situation of, of, uh, of a discordant pluralism feeding into the controversy. And the reason for that is that ethnographic methods are designed to overcome one's own biases. They are, they are meant to produce a situated account of what things look like from out here. Remember, the first ethnographers were anthropologists that would travel to some remote area in, in the Amazon forest or in, in, uh, in Polynesian islands, and they would sit in a village for six months and they would try to understand how local people that were very different from themselves saw the world. So this kind of training is now useful to try to understand the um, green transition from the point of view of somebody in the Gilets Jaunes. Another, good, another advantage of ethnographic methods is that they make cultural variables explicit. So this is, is a way that you can explain and uh, not only see, but even explain the values of difference, the, the value difference is a contested phrase because behind the technicality, some, there is just a, a, culture, a cultural variable that is pushing towards a different definition of what is good. Uh, I am an economist and in economics there is this uh, uh, presumption that people like uh, more equality. This is how welfare economic models are normally built. But if you look to survey data, depending on where the survey happens, in fact, there is a certain preference for some degree of inequality. And this is because uh, some, some, uh, some cultures associate 
inequality to social mobility and therefore to fairness. So they would prefer a fair, prefer a fair world that, that will produce an, an equal outcome to a equal, equal outcome which to them maps to some sort of authoritarian and, un, and unfair world. And I'm going to stop here. I mean, we have we are on, um, uh, made some, some experience with a project called Witness that I'm not going to talk about it now, to, to talk about now, that kind of seems to corroborate these, uh, uh, these ideas from the literature on political philosophy and uh, future studies. So that was me. Thank you so much, Alberto. I think now we came to the most exciting part where we can address all of the questions. So in the chat, there were no particular questions from our uh, from the participants, but there were many on your slides. And I think, um, yeah, we'll just uh, give the floor to the, to the person who wants to start addressing or giving any comments on any of the presentations. Maybe I can start with my own comment to, uh, and, and well, a not a comment, a question really. So uh, Lionel and Astrid have mentioned controversy, but Vasna and Roberta have not, and I would and I would like to ask them both: Do you have any any information on on uh, on, on controversies on on these grounds? Uh, where Roberta has even a special uh, base to do that from, which is Oslo. Uh, I would be interested. To, to see what the, to, to have a glimpse of what the, the, the debate on the ground looks like be, behind your, you know, very tidy slides in which, you know, it's all very clear, different uh, injustices intersect, and that's like, it, it, it's up there in the data. And I wonder if this is really how the discussion is, or if there are people contesting this, which would be my guess. If you want, I can start. <laughs> yes, uh, um, I would say uh, there are uh, huge controversies and you have already anticipated in relation uh, to uh, trans uh, congestion charge and uh, fees in relation to car free areas uh, and control over uh, uh, traffic uh, in Norwegian cities, especially in Bergen. Uh, in Bergen, uh, I think uh, two years ago, um, a political party which had uh, in the program basically just uh, the goal to abolish uh, this congestion charge uh, got the 15% uh, on local basis. So a very, very high, high percentage of local uh, votes. Um, this is a quite a strong movement in, uh, in Norway. When we uh, look at Oslo, um, we start to see uh, many uh, local committees uh, um, fighting against the process of densification. Um, Oslo is basically divided in uh, two uh, parts. Uh, the western part is uh, the most affluent, the eastern part used to be the less affluent uh, with a lot of um, manufacturing sectors, uh, factories uh, located in the eastern part. Um, what we can see it's uh, a lot of uh, uh, committees against process of densification in the western part. The western part because it's more affluent, because there are more people with the expertise of the local context and those um, who can uh, try to oppose to the process of densification. Um, so I have also a nice map of these conflicts and uh, um, you can see a lot of uh, demonstrations, committees against densification in the western part uh, of the city because uh, these rich people don't want um, more or less uh, uh, these areas to be densified because they really enjoy to live in uh, a suburban, uh, uh, wealthy, green uh, uh, area uh, of the city. So on the one side we have some NIMBY, uh, not in my backyard, um, um, contestations. Um, it's okay for Oslo grow, it's okay for Oslo grow economically, uh, demographically, but not in my backyard. This is quite clear. Uh, and on the eastern part, uh, where lot, the majority of this densification process were going on, actually, 
there used to be no contestation at all because uh, it used to be a very poor area uh, with a lot of um, minorities uh, not very uh, familiar with the language or with the regulations and so on. But nowadays, since the social stratification also of the eastern part is changing because there is gentrification, because there is uh, this densification actually has uh, uh, brought um, more affluent people also in the eastern side of the city. Nowadays, we start to see also some uh, contestations in the eastern part of uh, the city. Uh, these people usually are uh, afraid of gentrification or uh, uh, they um, also wanted to have uh, less densification, more green areas. So we start to see also contestation in the eastern part uh, uh, of the, the city. But uh, in, in general terms, I have to tell, when I first came to Norway, it was four years ago, and I was already concerned about this process because I was coming from context where this green gentrification process and uh, uh, housing and affordability trends were already very uh, fast and, uh, uh, and increasing. When I first came, the reaction was like, what you are talking about? Uh, I mean, everything is going so well, the housing issue is not an issue because we are all homeowners, so everybody is taking advantage of this uh, transformation in the city, because if you are a homeowner, you can just sell, you are not displaced, you are not kicked off <laughs> from your apartment. Uh, but actually, we were not able to see that uh, it, it was uh, just a, a trend of uh, uh, unaffordability uh, that now it's very it's a very huge problem because also uh, Norwegians uh, um, who live outside Oslo can't afford anymore to live uh, in uh, in the capital city in this fantastic green uh, blue capital uh, sustainable and blah 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 so basically there is uh, nowadays uh, this gap between uh, the insiders and the outsiders the insiders are the people who already have uh, an apartment in Oslo and can afford to buy another one in the city if we want to, to move. Um, and the outsiders, who are uh, the people who live uh, outside Oslo, can't uh, afford to, uh, to live in the capital city uh, anymore. Uh, the gap uh, between the housing cost of Oslo and uh, outside Oslo is uh, very big. So we started to understand and that actually it was not a win-win situation, uh, but there are losers and, uh, and winners, uh, and uh, unfortunately the winners are uh, usually the usual ones. Um, so then maybe just following on from Roberta, I will respond on two levels. So one, talking about very concrete cases of conflict and controversy, but then I'd also like to step back and talk about some of the controversy that maybe isn't getting the attention that it should. So just in very uh, concrete terms, in Sweden, we have had a movement similar to the Yellow Vest, but not at the same scale and mostly operating uh, through social media, benzene or where communities were complaining about the increases in fuel prices. Um, and so that movement has actually grown to the point that they have also been invited to give opinions in the Swedish parliament. Um, I, we've been studying them and some of the research I'm doing on the energy transition and navigating the justice claims put forward. And one thing that's come out very clearly is that people are not against the energy transition per se, but they actually are feeling that they are being forced to bear the largest burden of it. And they do recognize that maybe they don't need cars, but what they're complaining about is sort of an issue linkage happening. So what we've seen is the, um, the removal of a lot of services like healthcare services, buses and so forth from the rural areas, which means that people are forced to drive cars. And so when they're complaining, complaining about the increase in fuel prices and so forth, it's also about the fact that we have this rural-urban tension 
at play. Um, it's also about the fact that they feel that they are not being seen, that most of the attention is being placed on cities and so forth. So there are a lot of dynamics to that. And I think we always have to recognize how complex these issues are. Um, another concrete example is from Denmark, where, um, as I mentioned in the chat, there is something called the ghetto plan. Um, and this is now a a uh, process that has mostly been focused on the idea of integration and a concern that largely immigrant communities and racialized communities are not fully integrated into Danish society. Um, one could argue that, I certainly do, uh, working with a group, the Collective Against Environmental Racism in Denmark, we've also seen that the ghetto plan itself also talks to, uh, you know, uh, raising buildings and housing areas to put new buildings in, a lot of like the gentrification that's been mentioned, but at huge cost to the climate. Uh, so if you actually do the calculations, you know, this is actually a, not a smart idea in terms of climate change itself, but there are other motivations for it. And so there has been a resistance to things like the ghetto plan and local communities arguing, but as Roberta said, um, there's also the political element to this, who has the power, whose voice is, vo uh, voice is heard. Um, most of the political parties in Denmark who are going into an election next week are not talking about these issues and are not raising the climate change concerns. So uh, very tangible issues there. Then I want to just put forward a uh, an idea as well that when we talk about controversies, we also need to sort of think at a level higher than that when we're in Europe. So for me, one of the elements that is important to think about is the fact that a lot of the climate movement in Europe is largely white middle class, um, talking about climate change and the future of our children, rather than engaging with climate change as a reality now. It's starting to change certainly through what we've seen with the heat waves in Southern Europe, the floods in Northern Europe and so forth, but it's still a very small and not very diverse group. And so not always representing all the issues. Um, another thing where we have controversy is of course, green growth is contested, right? The ecological modernization agenda is being critiqued by a number of scholars, but also activist groups. And that's where sort of this conversation about post-growth, about degrowth, um, as Alberto has mentioned, has been coming up. Um, from my perspective, I'm a scholar based in Sweden, but I am from South Africa. Um, I think it's also important that we understand that the container of degrowth is not necessarily just about looking at what are the economic measures that we have, but it's also, you know, a philosophy and a principles about saying what is needed for a good life, right? And understanding the elements of that. And that's a kind of social change that talks about how do we ensure more commoning? How do we ensure that we do things in a collective way and so forth? And then I think the third thing I just want to make uh, put forward as a controversy is that with Fortress Europe, we are also not seeing the concerns beyond our own borders, right? And this is a controversy that we're not always challenging. So uh, that's just, so I, I think that there is a lot of controversy to all of this. I think the ideas of bringing in social justice in climate change debates is all controversial. There are many who say we should only be focusing on climate change and not trying to put everything together because then it disperses our attention. It is all controversial. At the end of the day, I feel that we have to understand and engage with these controversies. But if we take a single issue approach, then we ultimately are going to lead to more of these injustices. I have maybe um, a question, if I may, on um, the um, maybe to you, Alberto, on the on the the use of uh, ethnography and how it could be beneficial in um, in exploring uh, alternative uh, futures and different futures. Um, of course, at Metos, we are advocate of, uh, of ethnography and we we use it a lot. And, and I'm glad that you mentioned. Uh, the controversy we have now in Brussels on the on the mobility plan, 
and the protest um, happening, um, which is quite hard to understand for a lot of people who have been, a lot of citizens who have been participating in the process in a very uh, participatory like uh, method, a process of building the, this plan for for years and years, and now we see a really a, a worldview clash, as you as you as you mentioned, between two uh, two opposite views on how to use the city and what we want to do in in our city. And people are pro and people are against. And so I really don't know how we will uh, solve this. There is even violence. There's even violence, oh. and and politicians are giving up against uh, the most uh, brutal uh, group. And, and so leaving the plan behind. And, um, and so there is no, at the end, there is no green transition um, happening because there is a, uh, it, does, it doesn't work. So I wonder how, or maybe if, if there is ideas or things we can put on the table on, through the use of ethnography or, or the methods we can help having these worldviews um, from the start, um, exchanging different views exchanging and on the table sitting at it on the table because we also know that uh, all this process participatory process and thinking about a green transition and trying to involve people usually involve as you said uh, Vansa, the white middle class uh, educated uh, people and those who like to think about and work about this so if we want to have a conversation on different world views it's also hard um, to bring all these people together around the table and through the use of ethnography maybe explore um, potentialities uh, for, for different futures yeah great question and i do want to take it but i see that there is a, a previous question in the chat for for roberta so maybe we start from there you mean mine? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, I was just wondering because it's always when we are talking about cities which are struggling with this or which are implementing these strategies and then we see all of these issues rising from it, I always try to wonder, okay, can we look at the successful examples or can we learn from um, other other uh, cities that are actually tackling this well and then you um, and now also Vasna mentioned Vienna and Barcelona so maybe just a few words on why you are why you are particularly mentioning those two from both of you. Okay, yes I'm always mentioning Vienna which is a city I know quite well because I spent three years uh, with the Marie Curie grant working on um, uh, green and diverse uh, cities, uh, com comparison between uh, Copenhagen and Vienna. Uh, I always mention uh, uh, Vienna because uh, um, in Europe, uh, also for path dependency, uh, uh, history of housing policy is very, very strong uh, after uh, the Second World War. Um, but still, it's a city very much committed um, to uh, develop policies for uh, housing affordability. We can, in some way, tell that uh, the brand of the city of Vienna is uh, uh, this one, uh, being able to provide uh, affordable housing solutions for all uh, its inhabitants. And this is very important because I think it's the only <laughs> capital city in Europe uh, that uh, we have doing this. Um, yeah, Red Vienna, <laughs> but uh, what we are trying uh, to develop more recently is about also, of course, greening uh, the housing sector. And we are doing this by densifying uh, a lot, but providing a lot of uh, uh, social housing solutions uh, and more recently, again, more municipal housing solutions in this kind of projects. Uh, so in comparison to Oslo, for example, it's not just the private market, uh, it's also a lot about uh, state intervention. Uh, there is a lot about uh, uh, innovation, social and uh, ecological innovation in uh, these uh, projects. So it's a very interesting example to look at. And also when they um, develop uh, strategies uh, for urban renewal, for example, targeting a specific uh, area of the city that is uh, quite deprived in terms of environmental pollution, uh, green and so on, they uh, have specific uh, strategies. The name is uh, um, uh, soft urban renewal. Uh, 
basically uh, they um, provide uh, some uh, um, uh, funding to renew entire buildings that usually are uh, rent out uh, and uh, they pay for the renovation of the building but um, the uh, owners are supposed not to raise uh, the rents for at least uh, five or ten years and additionally uh, by densifying on the top floors they are able also to provide a new uh, apartments uh, for the social housing so uh, of course, uh, uh, it's a lot of money, public money spent on this uh, issue, but uh, uh, they try to, to develop these kind of strategies. It's a, an important pillar of the welfare state. Uh, of course, uh, also in Vienna, there are gentrification trends, uh, housing and affordability trends. We, Vienna is uh, uh, in the real world of finance and uh, housing uh, uh, financialization, but at the same time, there are some uh, efforts to develop uh, both ecological innovation, social innovation, and uh, housing affordability in the in the sector. So it's a very interesting example to look at. Thank you so much. This is good to hear. Um, I don't know, Vasna, do you want to add anything on Barcelona, maybe? I, I mean, I don't want to take up too much time on this, but yeah. just to say that the model of Barcelona and Camus, where it is Barcelona and Commons with Ada Calau, now the mayor of the city, has really worked to tackle some of these issues. It's about participative democracy. It's about trying to tackle the form of tourism, where there's a lot of... Uh, you know, housing that's just there for Airbnb and so forth and stopping those sorts of things. But also the process of inclusion, I think, is, is important to learn from. So to me, it's one of those uh, stories that we can learn. Thank you so much. So maybe now we can also go back to Daniel's question and then we have another one in the chat to, to talk about. So uh, Lionel and everyone, when I think about the role of ethnographic analysis in this kind of stuff, uh, I think of this uh, the work that, that Ferguson did in, uh, in Lesotho. Uh, so he, this is a, it became a book called The Anti-Politics -Anti Machine. And basically this, this is a typical anthropological move. This guy walks into a, a, a large development project that ostensibly was about um, promoting the uh, switch to cash crop farming in a mountain area of a small African country. And then he, he starts to ask, you know, where does this idea come from? You know, what is it that you guys really do? Uh, he starts reading the, the reports that uh, uh, underpinned the, the project, this, this large development project, and he noticed that uh, there are some inconsistencies. So the reports start by saying, this area is really out of the global markets, is, is, is disconnected from, from the global economy. They are, they are mostly working on subsistence uh, farming. But then he says, well, that's not compatible with another information that is found in the same report, which is that basically about a quarter of the male population of this area is working in the mines in, in neighboring South Africa. So in fact, they are really deeply plugged into the global economy, just in a different way. And, and it, it, he concludes that development project is just doing development and development is a kind of, uh, or he studies it almost as if it were some kind of ritual of a mysterious community, which in this case is, you know, the World Bank uh, that was funding this kind of thing and <laughs> the, the Western governments were bankrolling it. And it, uh, it, uh, its uh, final effects, uh, intended or not, were to reinforce the presence of the state in, the, in this mountainous area. So I imagine that you could do the same with participation. So you ask, uh, how is it possible that a, a, a long and intense participatory project was, was deployed in order to make the Brussels Mobility Plan? And then when, on day one, when the Mobility Plan starts, suddenly People say like, ah, we don't want this. So wh wh where did the participation go? And I guess Ferguson would say, well, they haven't really been discussing the plan. They've been doing participation, which is about, you know, post-its on whiteboards and it's about making like nice workshops with, 
with consultants from a design background or whatnot? Maybe not, I don't know, but it, it's, it, 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 we should certainly not assume that, be, that because we are going through the motion, we are actually learning anything about how people on the ground perceive the issues. And uh, uh, ethnography, in theory, should be able to do that. It should be able to send somebody into the field and then they come out, send somebody into the field we, 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 in the field they don't understand. This is the, the great power of, of this kind of analysis. It doesn't assume a, a good theoretical understanding of, of the problem you're studying. You go in with as little priors as possible and you come out with something. So I'm, I'm more of a quantitative uh, analyst of ethnographic data, but Maybe in this case, even some old fashioned field work would be enlightening. I, I would really, I would really know. It, it, my, my personal hypothesis is that participation uh, processes are designed by the same people that design the policies. So, white middle class, uh, relatively privileged. So the people that do come are those people. And then when, when, when the policy hits the ground, there are people that were never at the table, even though we have done participation. I don't know. That's a hypothesis. Let's find out. Thank you, Alberto. It's uh, of course it rings a bell, and um, and I think to maybe to bridge the gap between the necessity to understand a situation and to make it participatory, there is a, um, a method, a tool called collaborative ethnography. So it's about indeed being time in the field, but create knowledge and 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 solutions and together with the people uh, that live in the field. And I think maybe that's uh, that's one approach. Alton, I believe you wanted to react to this. Sorry, I, I, I know I'm talking a lot, but this really excites me because I, I do think that ethnography is so critically important. Um, and I think just to reemphasize uh, Lionel's point, because we want to move towards some kind of transdisciplinary way of working, right? So we're co-creating knowledge with communities because we need to avoid the sort of colonial version of ethnography, which is observation as an outsider. That's the kind of work we need to do. But I also just wanted to say very quickly that um, where I think this also ties in is we've been practicing public reflective equilibrium with communities as part of a research project, getting people to actually a group of stakeholders with different views and visions to come and talk together. And what's really interesting is how just sitting around a table for a day together allows people to understand different perspectives and shift their own position a little bit. Um, and then the other sort of process, which is more from activism, is we've been putting together citizens assemblies at a local level uh, and how these things. So I think there's huge opportunities for this. So I'll shut up now. <laughs> Yeah, as Albert says, no worries, even if we, we, we still want to be mindful about your own time, but uh, we are uh, yeah quite flexible there. But so there was also another question from Ivan um, for yeah, Lionel I, and Astrid. I, 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 thanks. I, I would really I would like them to elaborate on the, on, on the last question because I find it very interesting. And it would be, what do you precisely mean when you said that we could use health? Uh, the, the health is an approach to tackle the uh, things. Yeah, so um, we came across this health approach by actually um, there was a, a conference in Brussels just a couple of weeks ago um, that focused on this health approach. So wealthy, instead of wealthy cities, we go to healthy cities. And so thinking about this, this topic of um, green transition and, and a fair a green transition, you know, you end up in a, in a big debate or like two huge um, challenges. And is the, the social aspect, is the green aspect and, and how to, to bridge it. But as the, um, the people of, of the conference were, um, were putting forward, maybe a health approach uh, could be an all-encompassing way to to tackle a lot of these issues in in one topic so because um health of course we immediately think of a physical uh, the physical aspect of health but of course it's more than just that 
It's also about um, um, about well-being. It is about uh, safe spaces. It is about uh, spaces that are clean. It's about housing as well. Um, it's about how we use energy and and so healthy can be more than just our physical our physical health so it's health it's a health concept in a in a broad way and looking at it for also from a geographical perspective it can focus on on neighborhoods um, and so some neighborhoods uh, with a, a specific context they would have other needs um, would have other requirements, um, and so it, it, this, they put it forward as a potential, potential, potential solution to um, to bridge a bit the discussions about the social inequality and the green transition, and how to and how to 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 artificially combine them and how to work on it. Let's just move on and look at the health approach, and the health approach is multi-dimensional. For sure, and and then how to do that, um, and and as, as a result of looking at the health uh, situation and working toward a better health, it helps also transitioning uh, to a more uh, green uh, world. So it's a step to uh, to do it. And but so um, it, it's not a, a topic that we've been working on or that we're very familiar with. For us, it was just an interest, in, in interesting uh, thought and, and a way to, to put our minds on. Um, and so we also wanted to, to see with you what you thought uh, about it. Um, so it is indeed, it, it struck a chord when, when, when you told it, uh, when you said it, and. Uh, Yes, we have been looking into the into, well, area from, from a side into the, our possibilities, but a, a general approach, it's, it's absolutely, if you start, if you take the health as, a, as the main measuring point, you can, you can develop all sorts of things around this. It's absolutely a, a valid, valid, a really valid point. Guys, I have a question also in we are in the closing time. We will be working on exploring the other the, the, the costs and potential funding to, uh, to build around the Jedi projects with equality participation, uh, justice environment participation in equality. And uh, I would really like to thank you for, for your time. And I think we produced a very interesting discussion. I'd like to hear also from the others if. Uh, if any other uh, question is hanging, and you'll be hearing from us in the meantime. Thank you for organizing this. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to sink my teeth into the stuff uh, in the context of a serious research project, uh, which is overdue. Look, uh, are we producing the write up from, from, from everything to, in order to have document points and so on? Yeah, so thank you also from my side and looking forward also to reading this write up and maybe consider, considering continuing the conversation on the platform at writers.eu. Um, so, yes, thanks again. Uh, if anyone wants to say any closing words, um, otherwise, have a really great day and looking forward to staying in touch. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for having us. Thanks a lot for all the presentations and the, the work being done and very inspiring conversation we had today. It was a pleasure. It was really inspiring, yes. Thank you. Thank bye. you. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye. Bye.